Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another super easy strengths and materials video on strain rosettes. This one's going to be uh, a quick solve just to get to these unknowns and really fire it off as if it was like an exam problem. Uh, and if you need an understanding of the theory, I would recommend going back uh, to earlier videos. But in this one, I just wanted to fire through it uh, as quickly as possible, show you my thought process uh, and figure out how to get to these unknowns based on this kind of cheat sheet uh, have in the corner with all of these uh, important formulas. And once again, these formulas are for strain that's developed. We have uh, principal angles, we have uh, max shearing strain, and principal strains. Uh, all of this is covered in an older video, so start there if you need to. But in this problem, we are asked uh, very similar questions where we, we need to determine the principal strains and the maximum shearing strain. And it gives us our unknowns based on these three strain rosettes or strain gauges, sorry. Uh, it gives us the material property of Poisson's ratio of one over three, and it tells us the individual strain developed by each of these strain gauges with respect to uh, the angle of inclination that's given in the problem. However, we can't necessarily work with these angles given because we know that for these problems, we have to take theta inside of these equations with respect to x. And the convention that we normally use is when you're going counterclockwise, uh, that counts as positive. So any angle with respect to x that's going in the counterclockwise direction, we will take that as the positive angle when plugging into these formulas. So first things first, let's start by identifying some of our unknowns. So a super easy one that we can write off the bat is for epsilon a, or the strain at a. That is given to us as 1000. And this is a pretty much unitless measurement where you have millimeters per millimeter or whatever reference you're using uh, for the dimension. But this is given to us as a thousand. But since it's aligned with the x-axis, we can also determine that the strain of x will be equivalent to the strain of a. And that value is going to be a thousand micro and then whatever the units uh, that follow. And then similarly, we have to go ahead with epsilon b. Uh, epsilon b is given to us. However, it's not aligned with any uh, particular reference axis right now. So we'll just write down that epsilon b is going to equal to 750. And then the angle for epsilon b is going to be important now because we don't have uh, a particular ac axis that it's aligned with. So what is our theta b going to be? Well, theta b, as I said, should be with respect to the x-axis. So if we're going to be aligning with uh, the line of action, let's say for the strain at b, we have to first go from x. We're going 90 degrees. We have 60 degrees here. So if I drew a line like this, we know that in order for this to be 90 degrees, this angle would have to be 30 degrees. So if we're taking 90 here, and adding 30, we're going to have an angle of 120 degrees for theta b. Now let's look at theta c. Very similar thing. First, we write down uh, that epsilon c is a given value of negative 650. And then theta c, a little bit different. If we imagine that our x-axis is right here, then we're going to be doing two full 90 degrees here and here. And then once again, we have to think a little bit more. We have the Z pattern uh, with respect to this and that angle being created between the line of action and that uh, reference axis drawn here is going to be 60. So if we did 90 plus 90 plus 60, we're going to be left with 240 degrees. And now we can finally start to plug in to our formulas in order to start solving for some unknowns. All right, so now we plugged into the equations that are relevant uh, to us for this problem. We need to solve for two unknown variables, which are epsilon y and the shearing strain xy. And the only way to do this would be to set up a system of equations so that you can solve for one variable and then plug in for the next, right? So that's what's going on here. We've just plugged in our variables that we already know. We'll do a quick rundown just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, 750 is epsilon b. We have 1000 for epsilon x which has been solved for or um, justified just down here. And then we have to make sure 
that this theta value that we uh, solve for, theta b, is plugged in uh, with proper parentheses. Because if you're plugging this into your calculator, you can run into some issues uh, with the output uh, if you don't have things separated properly. So I've kind of written it out in a way so that it should work perfectly fine if you're going to be using this in your calculator. Uh, and yeah, it's a very similar thing for epsilon c as well. Just plug in the values that we have down here for epsilon c, uh, epsilon x, and theta c that we just solved for. So now we can go ahead and figure out what the coefficients and the actual values uh, for these two equations look like. Alrighty, so when you simplify these two equations, you're going to end up with something that looks like this for equation one, and then something like this for equation two. And the really convenient thing about this is when you plug in your values, you're going to notice that the coefficient for the shearing strain xy is equal for both equations, but have opposite signs. So if you simply go ahead and add these two equations together, you're going to end up canceling this term. What does that mean for us? This means that we can actually now solve for what the value of epsilon y is. So let's see what that looks like down here. So adding these two together, you're going to be left with another equation that looks like this, just epsilon y left over. And solving that, you're going to be left with a value for epsilon y equals to negative 266.7. And then you can go ahead and pick either of these two equations and solve for the unknown variable that was canceled out previously. So shearing strain xy can now be solved for in equation one or equation two, as long as we plug in this epsilon y value. So let's take equation one and see what that looks like in order to solve for that value. Alrighty, so bringing back equation one, plug it in your epsilon y, and isolating for your shearing strain x, y, you're gonna be left with a value that looks something like this. You're gonna have negative 1,616.6. All right, so now we're cleaned up here a little bit and we have epsilon x, epsilon y, and the shearing strain x, y all solved for, which means we can finally proceed with our principal strain uh, calculations for plane P1, P2, and then also P3. Alrighty, so now here's everything uh, for the rest of the problem. I'll just quickly run through it so that uh, we're all on the same page. We're just plugging in the variables that we already have. So epsilon x, epsilon y being plugged in right here. And then for principal strain uh, one, we are using addition. And then principal strain two, we're using subtraction. And a very similar thing, we're just plugging in the numbers that we previously solved for here. And then outputting both of these from our calculator. So uh, principal strain P1 and P2 are both solved for here. We have 1,394 and negative 660. And then you have to do the same thing, same type of solving process for principal uh, strain P3, where we're using Poisson's ratio uh, in this formula as well. So you can see the formulas just up here. We're plugging in that 1 over 3 that's given inside of this problem, and also epsilon x and epsilon y that were solved for previously. And when you go ahead and solve that, you're going to be left with a value of negative 367. And then we can take all three of these principal strain values and determine what our maximum shearing strain is going to be based on the output from uh, the three different uh, scenarios where max shearing strain will occur. And we have uh, three different options where we can test uh, which one will output the maximum value. Uh, but just for the sake of uh, being quick in this problem, uh, we're going to know that the principal strain P1 and P2 are going to output our largest value just based on how the formulas are put together. So you can check the other three. However, when you do uh, epsilon P1 minus epsilon P2, you're going to be left with a uh, formula that looks like this. So 1,394 and then minus negative 660. Those two are going to be added together to give you 2,000 and 50 as your final answer for the max shearing strain. And then you also have all of your final answers for principal strains as well. Alrighty, so that was a quick solve. Uh, I understand if you haven't seen the theory, this might be a bit confusing, but just go back uh, to previous videos if you want to recall on what all of these values actually mean and uh, where this kind of logic is coming from in the first place. So I hope this helped. Thanks for watching.